Thank you, Jesus, for today. Thank you for your um, care and kindness over us. Lord, we just settle down now. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come. We invite you to invade our lives once again. Filling us up with your peace, with your joy, with rest. We rest in you, Lord God, right now. We set our eyes on you, the author and the finisher of our faith. For the joy set before you, Jesus, you endured the cross for us. For us, that we could have victory over the world, over the flesh, and over the enemy. So we say yes to you, Lord. Yes to your word. Yes to your ways. Thank you, Lord God, for freedom from all the lies of the enemy. We just thank you. We put on your peace right now. We put on your, your joy. And we just thank you, Lord, for this time in your word. Speak, Holy Spirit, to us personally, specifically, what you have to say. Work in our hearts in the areas that you desire to touch. And Lord, more than anything else, more than anything else, Lord, encounter us with who you are and the depth of your love for us, your care for us. Show us more of your goodness today, Lord. We just thank you for that. Thank you, Lord. You're so good. You're so kind. You're so faithful. You are the God of more than enough and the God of the impossible. You are the God of peace and of joy. The God of mercy and compassion. The God that fills us up to overflowing. That we function not in and of ourselves, but we flow being led by you to touch others around about us. We just receive your love and your tenderness towards us right now, Lord. We receive it. We receive it. We thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. You, well, yeah. You were praying when you said that word flow. Flow? Mm hmm. I saw a river flowing uphill. Mm. And I, I really felt like God just dropped it in my spirit that we can go against the flow in the natural. Yep. Whereas yep. when yeah. we're in the river of the Holy yep. Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's what Pat was sharing at the beginning is just this choice of. You know, we will have negative emotions. We will have negative thoughts. We're going to have negative things come our way. And daily. I mean, that's not, you know, that's not unusual. Like once in a while, daily. And daily, we join with the Father in what He says. We're like, ah, I agree with you. And it's awesome. It's so awesome. Last week... Uh, we were, we talked about dying to the flesh and I made this comment that it's really fun when you see yourself die quick, like, oh no, I don't get to be upset about that. I don't get to walk in fear right now. Stop. Father, what do you say? And that's, that's an exciting thing to get to. All right. Uh, we're going to start on page 61. Uh, but I am going to review from um, verse 8 up to 16. If you remember last week, we covered a lot. Um, and there were things that I had sent with you guys home 
to do. Um, and so if you didn't, you know, just go back and look at the different stuff um, when you have time. But I want to start with verse 8, kind of just setting up once again the storyline. Um, up to this point in the whole book of the Song of Solomon, <clears throat> it's been really fun to see uh, the Shulamite maiden, her growth in um, her relationship with the beloved. And it is very much a relationship. It's very much back and forth communication where she'll say something and he'll say something in return and then she'll say something. And something that we've noticed that's so key is she makes declarations about herself that don't really line up with what we see in the natural. And he makes declarations over her that we don't see line up in the natural. That she'll declare over herself that, um, you know, that she's wholehearted, even though we see her vacillating back and forth. And he declares over her, you know, you have dove's eyes, you have undistracted devotion. And it's just really awesome to see that this is the way it works. You know, we actually get this mindset that we will get to a place where we've got that thing down. You know what I mean? And it just isn't happening. It just isn't happening. No matter how strong we get in an area, we always have opportunities to trip up in that area. We always have opportunities to become discouraged or self-focused in an area. And we have to keep on declaring the word. We have to keep on declaring the truth over the facts. The truth over what we see in the natural. We keep on declaring it. If we go our whole life and we declare the truth over a situation and we don't see that situation at the end of time pan out the way we thought it would, we will have kept our heart right along the way. Amen. We will have stayed in peace and stayed in joy along the way. And that is what the Lord is after. He's after an undivided heart. A heart that's not wishy-washy. A heart that's not tossed to and fro. He's after a heart that says, I believe you no matter what this looks like. What you say is true. And so that is first and foremost what we're after. So often in the Christian life, we see the promises of God and we want the promises and we should. They were paid for us. But we don't tend the heart. And so the promises always seem harder to grasp, harder to get. And when we tend our heart, which is what this class is all about, is we're tending our heart that no matter what the disappointing situation is, I am yours and you are mine. His heart is for me. I don't understand the situation, but I know he loves me and he is going after my best. And when I tend my heart, it seems like things are good even in, you know, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but I fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they're comforting me. There's a whole different perspective instead of going from one situation to the next, just trying to get through the situation. And so we see her, we see the maiden growing in this. And we're going to look at um, 2.8. And I'm just going to read it out of my Bible because it's actually several pages, but we're going to get up to page 61, which is uh, chapter 2, verse 16. Um, so she says, The voice of my beloved... Uh, behold, he comes leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. I love it that she knows his voice. She knows his voice because she's asked to know his voice. She knows his voice because she has sat under the apple tree and listened to his voice. She knows his voice because she has cultivated hearing his voice. And when we're running around 100 miles per hour, 
not ever talking to him through the day, we're not going to know his voice. We are only going to know his voice when we, first of all, take specific designated time in his word, in prayer, stopping and listening. But then throughout the day, we calm ourselves. We have 30-second prayers all day long. We calm ourselves and we're like, ah, oh, Lord, what are you saying? You know, and I'm not just talking about you're upset. I'm talking about calming yourself from activity. Like you're, you're being so active that there's not that taking time and going, ah, oh, what do you, Lord, what do you say about that? And that's what comes, what she actually has been doing. And she's knows his voice. He's leaping on the mountains. He is Lord over all. Nothing is too big for him. Okay? So, let's put that in perspective. He's leaping on the mountains. Nothing's too big for him. So, we have this mountain of uh, a wayward child or this mountain of um, uh, a, a bad diagnosis or this mountain of, you know, all these different things. And... He is Lord of the mountain. He is, there is nothing too big for him. Now we've talked about, of course, there's situations, there's people involved, there's free will, there's things that actually God will not override that man has to cooperate with. But even in those situations, he is Lord of the mountain of fear in that situation, of regret in that situation, of despair in that situation. You guys see what I'm saying? The situation lots of times will only change when people are cooperating with God in the change. But everything in us can be right when we submit that to him even in the middle of the storm. This is a huge deal. Because we see the mountain as being conquered, is the situation being changed, then I'll be at peace. But a lot of things are weighing in there. But when I come to the Lord, this is just me and him. Nothing else has a part to play except for me and him. I'm like, Lord, I want peace even now. I want to be in total trust in you even now, in the middle of it. So, he's Lord of the mountain. Let's see here. Uh, verse 9, My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He is looking through the window, gazing through the lattice. So they have created this place, the beautiful place of, it's their place, it's their communion place, it's their but it's also become her comfort place. It's where she wants to camp out and just stay there. Um, it, it's why people don't leave their homes. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like why people don't leave their homes sometimes. It becomes like this sanctuary. If, I, if it's just me and him and there's no conflict and there's no issues and there's no stuff. But he comes leaping over the mountains and he comes up to this wall and he stands behind the wall. He actually wants her to come out of her comfort zone. And it's a really, um, I think that coming out of your comfort zone is not coming into chaos. It's not like, there. here's the comfort zone, and it's all good, it's me and Jesus, and then I'm going to come back out into the chaos and the frustration, the fear. That's not what it is. It's actually, he wants her to go up some mountains. He wants her to um, grow. He wants her to be used by him. He wants her to affect other people's lives. He wants her to mature. And um, so he's, he's standing behind this wall, and that's what he's wanting. So my beloved spoke to me and said, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. I love that. Rise up. Come on, you can do it. You're beautiful. 
you, you're mine. Come away. And she doesn't. She doesn't move. Right? Verse 11. He begins to inspire her to obey. Okay? That's what these next few verses are. It's the inspiration of the Lord upon her heart to obey him. You can trust me. Do you know what? The word is full of that. The word is full of verses and scriptures that the purpose is to inspire us to know we can trust him. We can trust him. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and you can find rest. It inspires us to go, oh, 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 that's right. That's why we need to be in the Word. We need to be writing out those scriptures that touch our heart. And we need to be reviewing them and going over them. That's what Jesus is doing with her right now. The Beloved is doing with her right now. Verse 11. This is his beginning. He says, for the winter has passed... The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come. How do you like that one? The time of singing has come. It's it's time to rejoice. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in the land. The fig tree, verse 13, puts off her green figs. The vine with her tender grapes give a good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. He actually is encouraging her. Hey, 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 look at you've grown so much. The winter's over. That struggle's done with. There is the harvest is right around the corner. It's right around the corner. The answer is right there. Continue on. Do not grow weary. You will reap a harvest. Do you know what? That that is a promise to us. Those are promises to us personally. That we need to stir our own soul with. Don't grow weary. You're going to reap a harvest. How do I know that? Because he said so. Because he said so. That's why. We go to the word and we stir our own heart. You said this, Lord. This was not my idea. This was your idea. You said it. That if I don't grow weary in well-doing, I will reap a harvest. Now, Holy Spirit, empower me to not grow weary. We have these conversations with the Lord. So he comes to her. He encourages her. Verse 14. Oh, my dove, in the cleft of the rock. And because she doesn't move. I, I kind of think of each verse as like a pause in their conversation. You know, she's not moving. He continues on. Oh, my dove, in the cleft of the rock, in the secret place of the cliff, let me see, let me hear your voice. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. He actually gives her something to do. Okay, you're struggling here. You don't really want to obey. You're not walking in freedom in this area. This is what I want you to do. Let me see your face and let me hear your voice. We come before the Lord. We position ourselves. Here I am, Lord. Ah, I see you. You see me. You are good. I am your daughter. Let me see your face, right? Let me hear your voice. I begin to declare the truth. I begin to say what he says. This cannot be understated. The power of agreeing with the word of God out loud all day long. There is a spiritual principle that begins to uproot the lie and establish the truth in a way that it begins to grow and mature and take root in our lives as we continue to declare what he says. And that's what he's asking her to do. And notice, 
He doesn't say to her, okay, could you just say what I say? Saying what he says is good. But he actually says, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. It's a very personal positioning of her. Okay? And I've talked about this before. I love scripture lists. I have my whole life. Praise the Lord. I love them so much because it got the word in me. But there's a difference between having a scripture list that I repeat and say because... I'm just saying it and stopping and looking at him and saying, you said that by Jesus' stripes, I'm the healed. I believe you. You said that I would not beg for bread. I believe you. You said, Lord, that you would lead me into triumph. I believe you. It's this it's this looking at him and having a conversation with him around his promises. This is huge. Karen, yes. I remember about 10 years ago. Can you speak up so everyone I, can I hear you? I remember about 10 years ago, we really just started getting hit in our family. A lot of stuff going on. And I remember God sending Holy Spirit to just ask me, Trisha, will you still trust me? no matter what things look like, feel like, sound like, even taste like and smell like. Yeah. And I, I had to say, I'm not there. Mm -hmm. I'm not there. And I've been saying that for a lot of years. And every time I would say that, he says, but we're getting you there. Yeah. But we're getting you there. That's I awesome. will get you there. Yeah. And as we've been going through this drama with my husband and that, cancer word that has put so much fear mm. into so many of my family members. It's been amazing because I feel like in this situation, I'm, I'm there. Mm. I am there. And I just, I want to encourage you to just endure through the process. Yeah. Because yeah. we have people here to encourage us, like Marilyn mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Sandy and Cheryl and so mm -hmm. many people. I mean, every single person in this room has spoken life over mm -hmm. my situation, whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. And um, God, yes, he uses it all and he begins to put it together. And I feel like he's filling in something inside of me that was empty. That's awesome. That's and awesome. filling it up with good stuff. I feel, I feel like that's one thing we have to be really careful about. We've talked about this a couple different times is we begin this journey in this process and we're learning to fellowship with the Father around His Word and we're learning to declare the truth and then we hit something else and our flesh reacts like every flesh does, Right? And we think, oh, it's not accomplished anything. I'm still where I was. But you're not. You're not. You know how I know? Because the Word of God says so. The Word of God says it will not return void, but it will accomplish what it has been sent to do. And we're not the same. And so we go through that and we fight through it. It's the fight of faith, right? Right. And uh, we fight through it, and we continue on, and we get through that, and we continue to grow, and we continue to grow. And we are growing. We are going from glory to glory. And with each opportunity to walk out in a greater degree of the truth, we will see ourselves do it with more uh, grace, more direction of the Holy Spirit, more... Uh, it's quicker, prettier than in the past. We really will. And it's really awesome when we do. Um, and it's a, it's a growth thing where sometimes we're feeling like, ah, not even getting there. But we are. As long as we continue in our relationship with the Lord. So, um, verse 15, we're almost up to where we're starting today on page 61. Verse 15, here's another thing he gives her to do. Catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vine. For our vines have tender grapes. 
So not only are we going to declare, let him see our face, have relationship with him. Not only are we going to lift our voice to him, speak the truth, but we are actually going to catch the little foxes. And in the Passion Translation, I love that they say, let us do it together. It is this, let us catch the little foxes. And I've talked about this um, before, and I love to do this when I have a negative thought, a negative emotion. Um, I, uh, not every time I would like to, but uh, I think maybe probably it's, it's like when it's really profound, and I'm like, ah, like fear just grips me. I'm like, Lord, what, what, where is that coming from? What's the reason? See, I know fear is a fox, but I want to know the little fox. I want to know the reason. I want to know the sneakiness of the enemy. Where is he trying to get at me in this? And the Lord will show you. If you ask him, Lord, what is that? And there's been things where the Lord has showed me where I've had to repent. Okay, Lord, I repent of that mindset. Holy Spirit, come change it, fix it, fix the way I'm thinking there. Um, feeling like I have to be the answer in people's lives. I have to help everybody and get it done quick. And you know, all those pressures where the enemy, I have grown so much in that where now if it pokes its head, I see it right away. That's oh, that's that little fox. And what is the little fox's goal? It's to take out the tender grapes. Right. It's to remove the fruitfulness of somebody's life. You can go through a tragedy in your life and be taken out of commission until you go home and see Jesus. Or the Lord can do a work in you and those little foxes and those lies and that torment and that regret and that insecurity and all those things can be taken out and you can actually be very fruitful. Fruitful in your relationship with the Lord and fruitful in your relationship with the body of Christ. And that's what he wants. So that brings us to verse 16. We did read 16 and 17 last week, but we didn't look at it in depth. And so I want to start off there today. Anyone have anything to say before we get going on that? Okay. Where is Job in the Bible? It's, it's right around the middle. The heaviest part. It, it's, <laughs> it's the heavy part. It's right, is it right before Psalms? Yes, there we go. Okay, awesome. Awesome, awesome. Okay. Um, all right, top of uh, page 61. So the Shulamite finally responds to him. He's been talking to her for a little bit here, trying to encourage her to get out of bed, to go up the mountain. That's his goal, to go up the mountain with him. And uh, I said this last week, and you'll see this real clear in a second. I think of like the vineyards over here, the house on the vineyard with the wall around it, and she's in her house, and this is their like happy place, okay? And then you have the city. The city can be looked at as a couple different things. We won't talk about that right this second. And then you have the mountains are over here. And he has come leaping on the mountains, and he's come up to the wall, and he's talked to her, and she's talking back to him now. And she says, my beloved is mine, and I am his. He feeds his flocks among the lilies. My, I, my beloved is mine and I am his. The maiden has developed a confidence that the bridegroom is hers and she belongs to him. She knows that even in her weakness and failure that they belong to one another and she declares it. This is foundational. This is what everything else is built on. Amen. I am his and he is mine. In the middle of of my unbelief, in the middle of my struggle, in the middle of my frustration, I still belong to him. I still belong to him. 
And he's still the one I seek. And she declares that. I love that. I, I almost just wonder, just kind of like to picture the situation where she's been having such a great time with the Lord. She's so been enjoying his presence, right? And then he comes to her and he's like, hey, let's go up the mountain. And just that struggle. Have any of y'all been there? Where you're like, I don't want to. Like, I don't want to do that, but I love you. You know, <laughs> it's, like, it's, not, it's not like I don't love the Lord, therefore I don't want to obey him. I love him. I want to obey him. I just don't want to do what he's asking me to do. Do you guys see this? And it's just to think of what this might be going on. I mean, I feel like I've been there before. Y'all been there before where it's like, Oh, I know what he's telling me to do. I know what he's asking of me. I love him. I want to obey him. I want to want to obey him. You know what I'm saying? But it's just, I don't really want to do that. And so I feel like that's where she is here. My beloved is mine and I am his. Then she makes this comment. He feeds his flock among the lilies. Now, she was called a lily, a lily among thorns. And y'all, do y'all remember what a lily meant? Purity. She was pure. She was actually, it also meant obedient. Obedient. She was called obedient. And then he says that he feeds his flock among the lilies. Lilies represent purity. Also represents obedience. Um, our spiritual strength is found in close relationships. This is plural, lilies, with other believers who also are uh, pursuing purity or obedience. I need to put obedience in there also. Um, we can feed one another, encourage one another in the truth. It's like, um, you know, we share with somebody a situation, a problem we're having, um, and instead of us telling them what we feel in the natural, it's that being amongst others that will feed us the truth, that will tell us, yeah, that's true, but, you know, let's walk in love. Let's, let's forgive quickly. Let's, let's choose life. Let's not do that again. I've had people tell me things. I'm like, oh, you can't do that. Like, No. No, really, <laughs> don't do that. This is what you, you've got to do this. Um, my daughter was having an issue with one of our renters, and uh, she actually had been not telling me about it because she knows it kind of irritates me. And uh, so, but, but it came out in a conversation her and I were having. Actually, the renter texted her while I was talking to her. And... Um, and so she said, I'm just going to blah, 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 blah. And what she had to say was really good. Actually, she needed to, like, take care of it. But I was like, yeah, and just do it with lots of love and <laughs> kindness. Because we choose love every time. She's like, I know, Mom. We choose love every time. Do you know what? We choose love every time, you gals. We choose love every time. No matter what the situation is, we choose love. It doesn't mean we don't confront things. It doesn't mean we don't take care of things. But we choose love every time. And so when we're talking to one another and we say these things, this is what she is seeing. She is enjoying. Um, in the box, right in the middle of the page, translation footnotes, the Hebrew wording includes the phrase, he browses among the lilies. I actually really enjoy this. This is really good. The Hebrew word for browse can also mean he takes delight in yeah, or to be a special friend. The same Hebrew word in Psalms 23, Three, one. The Lord is my shepherd, my best friend. I love that. I love that. 
My beloved is mine and I am his. He feeds his flocks among his special friends, his dear friends. Are we a friend of God? In, in uh, James 2.23, Abraham was called a friend of God. That's what comes from, let me see your face, let me hear your voice. That was what, we're a friend of God. I think that's really cool that she's establishing that. In Luke uh, 5, it talks about the friends of the bridegroom. The friends of the bridegroom. I am a friend of the bridegroom. I care about what he says. So remember, she's in disobedience right now. She's in disobedience right now. And she's saying this out. This is exactly what we talked about. She's declaring something over herself, over her relationship with the Lord, in the middle of disobedience. Do we do this? Well, maybe a little. Man, I'm serious. Let's, let's make a choice in the middle of our struggle to obey. We begin to proclaim, but I'm your friend. I'm your friend. I listen to what you say and I do it. This is how we obey. We don't obey by trying harder. We don't obey by making ourselves obey. We obey by declaring, I'm yours and you're mine. And I'm your special friend. And, and you talk to me and you tell me things. Let's go to uh, page 62. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> to her beloved, she says... Until the day breaks and the shadow flees away, turn, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag upon the mountains of Bether. So he asks her to come away. He gives her the reasons to come away. He tells her what to do to get her heart to say yes. And then she says no. She actually contemplates well, I'm his and he's mine and we're good friends, but no, I don't want to. And, you know, we can go, oh my goodness, come on, gal, get your act together. But how often do we do these things? I mean, for me, it's don't say that. Just don't say that. Just walk in love and don't say that. And then I say it, you know, and I make a choice to say it, you know. And so there's these things that that I don't know what it is, but it is a work of the heart that gets us to say yes quickly every time. It's a work of the heart. But even in the midst of that, we're going to see what happens. It's really awesome. So until the break, we'll, we'll just look at this verse a little closer. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, the day break comes in the morning when new light appears, it is the time when dark shadows or gray areas of the maiden's life are gone. Actually, what she is saying to him is, until I'm more mature, until I have my act together better, until I really know what I'm doing, and I really feel confident in me, let's wait on that. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> let's wait on that. The problem is, it's in the obedience that we become more mature. Amen. We become more together. Yeah. We, we, we do that. Bether, she says, um, upon the mountains of Bether, turn my beloved. Upon the mountains of Bether. This word Bether actually means separation. Which is a little crazy to me because she actually knows what she's choosing. She actually knows this will bring some sort of separation between her and him. But she's choosing it. Go ahead and just go on without me. Do it yourself. Um, I was thinking about that. Um, 
The man here is refusing to follow her beloved up the mountain that he asks to lead her up. He's asking to lead her up this mountain, and she's like, no, I don't want to. Although she loves him and still calls him my beloved, she tells him to go on without her up the mountain. And I was thinking about this. Actually, what she was refusing was partnership. Now, listen to what I'm going to say, because this is important. She wants him to do it without her. That's really what she wants. Would you just... For her? What, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just do it for me. Could you just, you know, haven't you heard people joke around, make me patient quickly. You know, it's like, it's like, just Lord, just fix this in me. Just to take care of that situation. Just resolve this. Just take care of it. And although there are things that we must trust the Lord with, Okay, this is an example. So we have a person in our life, and we would like them to change. And so we want to participate in that change by telling them what they're doing wrong, what they need to do better, uh, how to do it, what a good decision would be in this situation. Okay, so on and so forth. So the Lord comes to us and corrects us and says, hey, no, that's not what I want you to do. I want you to let me work in their life. Okay, so then we go, all right, Lord, do it. But there's still a participation he calls us to. And this participation many times is a prayer and a proclamation, declarations of life over that person's life, sending forth the word of God for, the God for God to work on their behalf and move. There are also times where the Lord will actually put on our heart to say certain things. And when we're really careful about doing that as the Lord leads, it's going to be with love. It's going to be in the right attitude. It's going to be in the right time. So it's not a um, either I'm in control or God's in control. It's a I am participating. I am working with God in a situation. Now, I have to believe in this situation, and I don't know for sure, but he's calling her up a mountain, I believe, of maturity. He wants her to grow in maturity, and there's some things that need to be dealt with in her life. She would rather just stay in the love closet. You know, she just wants to, you and me, and we love each other. And, and that's good. That's foundational. But there are things that we need to go, Lord, this does not look right in my life. Show me what is causing this. Show me. And I want to go with you. And I want to participate with you. It doesn't mean the Lord says to us, you know, hey, you need to talk nicer. You need to be more great, uh, grateful. You need to be more thankful. Okay, I'm just going to do that. You know what I mean? It doesn't work, as we well know, right? But when we participate with him, we go up the mountain with him. He leads well. He shows us things. We uproot the reason for some of that stuff. All right, chapter three. I love chapter three. So, he has wooed her. He has called her. Come, come, come. She says no. And you know what happens when she tells him, go away? He does. <laughs> It's really crazy. All of a sudden, she doesn't know where he is. Now, we're going to see that the Lord never leaves, leaves us or forsakes us. We know that. But there is something about disobedience. And there is something about telling the Lord, no, that we need to take seriously. Because it does something to our relationship with him. Our, not, not with our relationship as in we love him, he loves us. But in our communication, in our receiving of what he's saying, there is a blockage that happens when we tell the Lord no. And we need to take that seriously. We need to not just live in the villa. Oh, the villa, that's what it's called. We need to not just live in the villa and go, God loves me and everything's good and everything's great. And he's telling us, no, let's go take care of some things. And then... We're like, what's going on here? Something feels different. 
Something feels different. I just want to camp out in the villa. I just want to camp out in my bed. So let's see what happens. Verse 1. By night on my bed, I sought the one I love. Well, he's not there, right? Yeah. <laughs> I sought him, but I did not find him. Ah, this is so key right here, what she does. She makes a declaration. I will rise now, I said, and go about the city in the streets and in the squares. I will seek the one I love. I sought him, but did not find him. Okay, we're going to dissect that, and then we're going to see what happens next, all right? By night, she sought the one she loves. Again, remember how we talked about night seasons? It's just this, it's this dark, I don't know what's going on, it feels weird. So all of a sudden, she's actually put herself into that. She's put herself into that by telling him no. Then all of a sudden, there's not this closeness. There's not this, ah, oh, I can, I wonder why. Would it be him or her? <laughs> it's her. It's her. Is it regret? Is it shame? Is it um, condemnation? You know, in our disobedience, the enemy has an open door in our life for regret, shame, condemnation, insecurity in our relationship with the Lord. The Lord hasn't moved. The Lord still loves us. The Lord is affectionate towards us, but it feels different. Do you guys agree with that? It feels different. When I blatantly disobey the Lord, I feel that Yes, conviction of the Holy Spirit, which we should, but it's mixed with the flesh, too, where I've gone to him and I've repented, and then a few minutes later I repent again, and then a few minutes later I repent again. And Do you guys see what I'm saying? That's not the Lord. That's our flesh. That's the enemy. There has, there's this moment of separation where it's this feeling of, ah, oh, I'm not at rest with the Lord. My flesh is beating me up over that decision. It's an open door for the enemy to come and shake our resolve of how we stand with the Lord. And it says, I did not find him. The, the maiden sought the Lord but could not find him after she refused to go up the mountain. Um, when we turn our hearts away from the Lord and from obeying his voice in our life, many times it will cause us to not feel his presence, or be able to hear his voice as easily. The maiden here is learning the effects of disobedience on her relationship with the bridegroom. There is an effect of disobedience, not with his heart towards us. Do you guys understand that? It's our side of being able to receive his love. It's a, it's a shaking ground where the enemy wants to come and beat us up. Yeah, Julie? Disobedience is really pride. And I think because we're thinking of ourselves, yeah. we, we have. We want to do it our way. He can or whatever. Mm -hmm. But he says he resists the proud. Yeah. He gives grace to the humble. And that's not yeah. condemning or fearful. No. It's a lesson in our. Yeah. Flesh. It's actually really good for her because this is the first time she has felt anything um, of a correction. Any kind of, oh, okay, there is, there is actually a consequence from me turning my back on what the Lord is saying and me doing my own thing. There's a consequence. Now, lots of times people want to talk about consequences like God spanking them and doing bad things. That's not what the Word says. The Word does not say that. We go by what the Word says. And the word says that, like you said, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you, which we're going to see in a second. There is an effect on our relationship with the Lord when we choose disobedience. It's on our communication, our closeness. Do you guys see that? Then that's what's happening here. That's what we're seeing. Set your heart to obey. Set your heart to obey. Lord, I want to obey you. Holy Spirit, empower me to obey. 
I love that she I love that she said that she still calls him the one I love every time. Every time there's no question of their heart relationship now. It's a question of do I hear him? Do I sense him? Do I know what he's saying? You know, the other side of disobedience can be that you don't have confidence. Yeah. And that you can really do what he's called you to do. Mm. That you don't see yourself yeah. in him. You see yourself in yourself. Yeah. And you're not up to that call. Absolutely. Yeah, like, you know, you know, we feel the Lord pulling on our heart. Right. And then we're like, I don't know if I can handle that well. Go to Africa or whatever. Yeah. You know. Uh, or, yeah, or just something simple. Or something simple. Yeah. you yourself that confident. Yeah. Because yeah. you're yeah. not seeing yourself in Him. Yeah. You're seeing, and none of us are that confident. Mm-hmm. I, none of us are that good. No. None of us can achieve that without him. Mm-hmm. Whatever. It, it really whatever. is. It really is this uh-huh. understanding of our dependence upon right. him right. over our dependence upon just doing it. Right. And that's what we've been really talking about. What is this, the eighth week of class? We've been talking about up till now is this developing this total dependency upon the Lord, that it's him and me, and we're doing this together. And it's not just me trying harder. Trying harder does not work. It is us growing in our relationship with him, actually growing in our dependency upon him. In chapter 8, I mentioned this last week, in chapter 8, It talks about her coming up out of the wilderness, leaning on her beloved. And that is a sign of maturity. It's our goal is to lean and to lean well. Our goal is to lean upon him. And you can see here, she's decided to do her own thing. It's almost as if he, you you said he never leaves. Nope. But by turning our back Mm -hmm. on him. We can't see that he's still there. And so that's where... The yes, yes. It's the blocked. it's the perception and the yeah. feeling like we're hearing his voice and questioning that whole relationship thing where the relationship doesn't change. Um, I like that she says, I will rise now. She makes a declaration of obedience. Father, I will do what you tell me to do. Holy Spirit, empower me to do it. Even though it was easier for her to stay in her It was so much easier to stay in bed, but (laughs) in bed, she couldn't find him. Right, right. In bed, you see what I'm saying? She was seeking him and couldn't find him in bed. It wasn't until she said, okay, all right, I will obey you. I'm going to deal with this. And, and you know what? Getting out of bed sometimes is just dealing with an area of, um, I bring this up a lot because I know it exists in all of us, is unforgiveness. Where the Lord's like, let's deal with that. Let's take care of that. Okay, Lord, I forgive them. No, no, no. Let's deal with that. Let's really uproot that thing. Let's really take care of it. Um. So, top of uh, page 63, she arose and she goes about the cities and the streets and the squares. Right? I love it. Because this is all I can think is. That's not where he is and you know it. You know it. He said, I'm going to the mountain. But she went to the city. And she's walking around the city, and she's trying to find him. Some people liken the city to the church. It represents the church because the city is surrounded by a wall, and you have the gatekeepers, which the gatekeepers or the watchmen are um, considered the elders in the church. Okay? So some people think that this represents the church. That Okay, so I will... Go to the church, and I'll be around my people, right? And we'll talk about Jesus. But am I doing what he told me to do? But it makes me feel better, right? It makes me feel better that I'm around my people, and we're talking about Jesus, and we're doing Jesus stuff. 
She says, I sought him. I sought him. Let's see here. I sought him, but I did not find him. Um, Isn't that our first step? Our, our, our half commitment? Yes. Our absolutely. No, and that's what we're going to see. That she made a step towards obedience. She made a step towards obedience. The small reach of the heart. Yeah. Well, and it makes you hungry for more. Absolutely. When you're around friends of like thinking... You think, whoa. It's not a bad choice. It's a I, good choice. I, I like her. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like her. And she says, I can take back what's been stolen from me. And I say, that sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if I had been at the church, I wouldn't know that. Right. Because I wouldn't have followed. No, that's so good. Well, and when he tells us that we are sheep, mm -hmm. he is our shepherd. Mm -hmm. I do speak, and they do hear me, but we have to be listening. Yeah, we, we do. Be we have to be seeking. So she gets out of bed. We all say, yay, get out of bed, right? And she goes to the city. She goes and seeks for him. The Lord never leaves us, but we actually shut ourselves off from hearing his voice by us ignoring him. By us ignoring him in one area can actually damper us hearing him in other areas. Okay? So she's making a decision. She's going to humble herself and walk in obedience even if it's hard. We ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, anoint me to obey. Ask him for that. You feel the press of the Spirit upon you. I don't want you talking about that anymore. You ever have the Holy Spirit tell you that? I want to talk about it more. No, I don't want you talking about it anymore. Okay, Holy Spirit, anoint me to obey. I give this to you. Anoint me to obey. Um, so let's look. Let's go down to the middle of 63 where it says verse 3 and 4. So this is the Shulamite speaking. The watchmen who go about the city found me and said, "Have and I said to them, have you seen the one I love? Have you seen the one I love? She's seeking him. And like Diana said, the city was not a bad place for her to go. The church, like believers, <clears throat> Seeking the Lord in this situation, in this setting, I should say, in this setting is not bad. She even talked to the elders, have you seen the one I love? Now, verse 4, underline this phrase. Scarcely had I passed by them when I found the one I love. He came down to her. It is awesome. He came down and met with her. In her partial obedience, in her weak reach, in her weak walking out what he said, he met her. And this is the heart of God. This is the heart of God. The heart of God is to meet us in our weakness, but our weakness is a reach. It's a reach. <clears throat> our weak love is still real love. Our weak reach is still a reach. And he moves. He moves. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Yeah, Tricia. To me, it's like what Diana said. <clears throat> when you go to the church, there is something that happens there. It's like you can smell something, like as if, as if you're hungry, mm -hmm. and you drive by someplace that, that smells really good, <laughs> yeah. and it makes you want to pull in and eat mm -hmm. there. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I feel like it's pull that in, concept of... What we're supposed to be doing as the church mm -hmm. is to make other people hungry for what is available 
And that is what he says. He says, you know, blessed are those who hunger yeah. and thirst. Uh, they will be filled. That's good. And so it's like the appetite. Yeah, is yeah. Stimulated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really cool because we're going to see here something in a second. And I'm glad you guys brought that up because I want to establish something. The body of Christ was God's idea. Okay. Yeah. The body of Christ was God's idea for us to minister to one another and encourage one another. It was to point each other to the head. God's idea was for the body to point one another to the head. Okay? It was not to be the head. It was not to be the answer, but actually to cheer one another on and say, this is the answer. Go to him. Lean upon him. Grab a hold of him. So she comes across the watchmen, right? The watchmen um, are seen as keepers of the wall. In the natural, they were keepers of the wall. The watchmen were. But this is speaking as spiritual leaders. Okay, she comes upon them. She says, have you seen the one I love? We don't get their answer. Okay, so we don't know what happened there. But then it says, scarcely had I passed by them when I found the one I love. Now get this, I held him and would not let him go until I brought him into the house of my mother and in the chamber of the one who conceived me. So we're going to look at that, what that means. But I found the one I love. I found the one I love. So we just talked about it. He came down to meet with her. He came down. He responded to her small reach by meeting with her. And it says that she grabbed a hold of him and would not let him go. The maiden has a new resolve to hold onto the bridegroom. She has a new resolve. During her season of spiritual wrestling, she's cultivated a new love and passion for the bridegroom. Wow. Stop. Stop and think. In your season of wrestling, is it producing bitterness, weariness, um, resentment, dissatisfaction between you and the Lord, or is it building more resolve he is my only answer. He is my only way. I must have him. I must get out of my complacency and my comfort. And I must seek him. Because that is what needs to be happening with each setback, with each disappointment. We push forward more to him. Listen, that only happens when you manage your heart. Only. Bitterness Disappointment and resentment is the natural occurring thing of, disappoint, of, of, of a frustrating situation or a, a feeling of um, um, wrestling, a time of wrestling. That's the natural. But like, like you said, we go upstream. We go against the flow. We go against the natural. I'm like, no, I don't care what happens. I'm yours and you're mine. That's the truth. And you're good and you're faithful. Yeah, Diana. I finally believe you. Yes, I believe you. I, that's what it is. I believe you. I believe you no matter what. No matter what the situation. We, we get concrete in these things when we, when we do that. Yeah. I was thinking about Stacy's daughter. Yeah, Libby. Libby. You know, how, um, she had that wreck when she was little and crushed her hand. Mm-hmm. And she had to have 17 surgeries on that hand. And at some point, Stacy was wrestling with relationship with God. And God said, Stacy, are you going to love me anyway if I don't heal her hand? Mm -hmm. And she came to that realization that no matter what, she would love God. No matter what. And now Libby can play the piano like a master. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so she's totally healed. Yeah. But you don't see the manifestation of it mm -hmm. because her hand is... 
why mm. they're crooked. Mm -hmm. But I always think about that. Even if mm -hmm. it doesn't turn out the way I want it to. There has to be, yeah, there has to be an establishment in our heart that no matter what, things have to be good in between you and me. And see, that's actually what happened here was she chose not to manage her heart here. She chose to hide in bed. She chose to stay away from dealing with things where we must manage our heart. We must. So one day I was reading through this section of scripture, and uh, it was probably about four years ago. Um, my daughter Christina had had a heartbreak with a guy and was real upset about it. And she was really upset because you know how that happens where you seek the Lord, and you're like, Lord, what are you saying? What are you saying? And you feel like he's saying something, and then you follow that, and it ends up being not what you thought the outcome should be. She was really, really upset about it, really sad, and um, having a really hard time getting over the sadness. And I was reading through Song of Solomon one day, not for any purpose other than to read, and I came across this section, and the Lord highlighted it to me um, in the area of Christina. And later on that afternoon, I talked to her, and I was sharing it with her, and she was like, oh, man, that's so right on. And Christina is out at IHOP, out at International House of Prayer. At the time, they had a Friday night service and a Saturday night service. And then they have prophecy rooms over at the prayer room. A um, couple times a week, they have them open where you can just go and sign up for a prophecy. And she was doing it all. And at an IHOP service... A church service, they have a call, at least one, sometimes two calls for some sort of prayer. And so they really believe on people going up front, laying hands on people, flowing the prophetic, praying for people. It is a good city, mm -hmm. right? It's a good place to go. And so she was going to every service at the time. She was a student, so she was actually required to be there Friday and Saturday night service. She said, Mom, it doesn't matter what call they have, I go up. Like, she just needed a touch from the Lord. So she was going up every, every service. She was going to the prophetic rooms at least once a week, sometimes twice. She needed to be around people who were speaking life and truth to her. And so I said to her one day, that's all really good, right? Is that good? That's good. But... I wonder if you need to pass by them to encounter him. That's good. As soon as she passed by them, she encountered the one she loved. She grabbed a hold of him and would not let him go. I really feel like as we have the body of Christ feeding into us, go there, do this. Trust the Lord. Yes, you can. We have to still remember, I must hear your voice. I must see your face. I must have the answer from you. And I'll tell you what, those answers, those are the time, those are the kind you grab a hold of and don't let go. Amen. Those personal rhema word from the Lord I, I probably have about 10 major ones in my life that I know. I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, I must hear your voice. I need to know what you are saying in this situation about me, about this person. And he spoke a word to me and I still grab a hold of it. I still hold on to it. Lord, you said this, right? Right? So I can go to you and I can say to you, yeah, well, the Lord says this, this, and this. This is what the word says. This is what it means. This is what he's like. And it can stir your heart. And you, yeah, 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 that's right. But you will not hold on to anything like you will hold on to something you have heard straight from his mouth. You won't. It is a big deal. 
And so I was sharing this with Christina, and she says, yeah, Mom, you're right, you're right. That's, that's so good. And, um, and uh, she went on a ministry trip soon after that with her, with her classmates, and they were out in um, Pasadena. And uh, they were doing tons of worship, tons of house of prayer, street ministry, lots of awesome Jesus stuff, right? Running with the church. We are supposed to run with the church in the middle of our pitifulness. We run with the church. It's true. It's true. It's what we do. And she said one night, it was about, you know, five, six days into the trip, they were at a little church ministering, and there was a couch in the back, as all little churches would have, you know. And she sat down on the couch and fell asleep. And she wakes up, and when she wakes up, she wakes up to one of her uh, good friends. He's on the keyboard, and he's just singing prophetically about the goodness of God and laying things down and just cool stuff. And she's like, I don't know what's going on, but I know I have to get to the front of the church. And she gets up, and she goes to the front of the church, and there's people laying on the ground. It's a good place to be. Carpet time is good. I highly recommend it. And she says that she goes face down onto the ground, and she says, Mom, as soon as I hit the ground, I started to wail. She's not a wailer. You know, there are people that are. She's not. She starts, I start wailing. Like, I'm thinking, oh, no, people will be concerned for my well-being right now. She's just wailing. And she has this time with the Lord. And she just lays it down. And she said she physically felt the thing lift off of her. Scarcely had I passed by them when I encountered him. I grabbed a hold of him and would not let him go. There is this putting ourselves at the feet of Jesus and saying, Lord, I must have you. I must have you. I cling to you. What you say is what I will say. What you say, um, the Passion Translation, just as I moved past them, I encountered him. This is at the top of page 64. Just as I moved past them, I encountered him. I found the one I adore. I caught him and fastened myself to him, refusing to be feeble in my heart again. She knew. She knew what happened. She wanted what she wanted. All of a sudden, what she wanted wasn't near as important as having him. Saying what we want to say isn't near as important as obeying him. I have moments in my life that I've walked in obedience to something that was tough. One time, I I can think of two specific times. One time I said something I had not really wanted to say, but the Lord prompted me to say it. It was to one of my kids' friends. And by me doing that, the Lord moved in, in freedom in this guy's life. And I walked away with the fear of the Lord on me had I not obeyed. I was like, oh, what if I had not obeyed? I didn't want to. What if I had not? Another time was a time I did not say something I wanted to say. But instead, the Lord told me, you just cover it with love. And I did. And the outcome of it was the same. Where I was like, what if I had said that? Like, what if? There needs to be this dependency. I must know your voice. I must know what you say. And then I depend upon the Holy Spirit to empower me to do it. It's weighty. There are weighty things for us to take and go, okay, Lord, it's you. I'm obeying you. 
Um, page 64, I actually tell the story that I just got done telling. If you want to read through that later. Um, at the bottom, I talk about the ten virgins. Do you remember? The five at the end came to the five. The five foolish came to the five wise. And they said, give us some of your oil. And the five wise said, no, we can't. We can't do that. This is oil that cannot just be given away. There are things that cannot just be gotten from others. That's true. That's true. But go and buy. Go to those who sell the oil and buy for yourself. And that's us developing this relationship with the Lord. I will put in the time. I will die to my flesh. I will sit and listen to your voice. I will ask you, Holy Spirit, to help me obey. This is developing the oil, cultivating the oil. Man, wouldn't it be awesome if we could just get in a prayer line and get prayer for deliverance from ourselves and it just, bam. You know, there are touches of the Holy Spirit and there are supernatural deliverances. I, I know people that have been supernaturally delivered of addictions like that through a prayer situation. People that have been supernaturally healed like that. But most things, and let's just say these inner things, these inner things that comes from pursuing him and listening to him and agreeing with him. And it is a process, and it costs us something. Amen. But it's worth it. Amen. It's worth everything. We gain more than we pay out every time. And what's so cool is the Holy Spirit empowers us to do it. If we ask the Holy Spirit, empower me to obey, empower me to seek the face of the Lord, he will. All right, let's go to page 65. Anyone got anything to say? Is it, I mean, this isn't like fun. <laughs> what we're talking about right now, it's, it's sobering in some areas, but you know what? Would, wouldn't we rather have the answer and that leads us to victory than just happiness and, and it leads to no fruit? You know what I mean? We want fruit in our life. And this is, this is how it's done. So, um, praise the Lord. She got out of bed. Praise the Lord in his mercy and grace. He met her. He ministered to her. He's so sweet. He's so good. He's so kind. It's, it's just awesome. Page 65. So we're at verse 5. The Beloved says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles and by the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. We've heard this before, haven't we? Yep. Yep. Well, I think we'll hear it three times total. Now, she has just been in disobedience, but then she got out of her bed and she sought him. This is a good thing. She sought him, okay? And he met with her. So he's encountering her. He's working things out with her. And then he turns to the daughters of Jerusalem. Those are her buddies, okay? Those are her friends. They're looked at as mostly immature but sincere believers, okay? And he tells them pretty much, let her be. Let her be. Don't come with all of your great ideas, your to-do lists. You need to do this, this, and this. You need to do this more. You need to do that more. He pretty much tells her, I am talking to her about something. I am working with her on something. Let me have her. Oh, okay, so this works two ways. When we see somebody that is being dumb or has got done being dumb, okay? And there's different degrees of that. I mean, I'm dumb at times, you know? Um, 
and we're speaking to them, we really need to be gentle, and that's what the does and the gazelles are. Really gentle with what the Holy Spirit is wanting to use us to say to that person. And in a way that they'll receive. Um, but also, I just thought of this. We ourselves need to understand that although the Lord will use people in our lives to confirm things, people in our lives to speak into our lives and stuff, we also need to understand that the Lord is the one that does the work in us. And everybody else is not our answer. That's right. Not our answer. Not our answer. It's really important that we understand that He is dealing with us. He is speaking to us. If we're asking Him to, He's doing it. And he's doing it in the manner that he wants to do it in at that time. And we don't have to get our answer from everybody else. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? It doesn't mean that he doesn't. The body of Christ is his idea. He wants to use the body of Christ. But that is not our, our um, first go-to is people. Um. Uh -huh. It's like when you said the does and the gazelles, it's yeah. the hinds feet in high places. He takes us higher than the thoughts of men mm -hmm. and higher than our own thoughts. Absolutely. You know, and we can jump from that awkward place to a new awkward place and be safe. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We have got to understand that he knows more than we do. He really likes us a lot. He really has a good plan for us. We really can trust him. And I love it that he uses people to confirm things in our lives. I love that. But it's confirmation, not information that we That's want right. from people. Mm -hmm. We absolutely do not want people to be our answer. The body of Christ is built to encourage one another that what you said, it's just the Lord being sweet. What you said is what, what he's saying. That's true. That's true. Um. On 65, the uh, box, Mike Bickle, the Spirit ordains strategic seasons in each one's spiritual life. I totally see this. Don't you all see this? There are certain seasons in your life where the Lord just has his finger on something specific. I see the Spirit, he, he's saying that he sees the Spirit as speaking in, in verse 5, that this is actually the Holy Spirit speaking is what he feels like. There are seasons when he, speaking of the Holy Spirit, desires to establish us in a new experience and insight. The Holy Spirit wants us to not go around disturbing everybody else's relationship with the Lord or our own. What do I need to do more? What do I need to do more? What do, let's just have a conversation with the king. He knows. He knows. Let's see here if I want to go on to this next verse or stop there. Let's do, let's do um, one more verse here. Uh, well, it's actually three verses that I have together. So, the maiden's coming to a greater revelation of obedience to Jesus as being the safe and better path. You think we would learn this, right? When we obey him and we're like, wow, look at how awesome that went. And but it's this learning. It's this learning to trust him in the outcome. So verse 6 through 8. Who is this coming up from the wilderness like pillars of smoke? Ah, I love this. Perfumed with myrrh and frankincense. With all the merchants' fragrant powders. Behold, it is Solomon's couch with sixty valiant men around it. All the valiant of Israel. They all hold swords, being experts in war. Every man has his sword on his thigh because of fear in the night. So coming out of the wilderness, the question is, the Shulamite is saying this, the question is, who is this coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke? 
that's just cool right there because it's, it's him. It's him. He's coming out of the wilderness with like a pillar of smoke. Jesus is the one who leads us out of the wilderness of this world. He came up victorious out of the wilderness of this fallen age. You know, I don't have this in here, but we all know the story how he went into the wilderness and came out victorious. Do you all remember how he came out victorious? What did he use to defeat the devil in the wilderness? The word. He said, this is written. This is written. This is written. I was reading through my notes this morning, and I was just pondering. I know that this has to do with the cross, and we're going to see that. But I was just like, wow. Not only the wilderness that we know that story of, but he came out of this wilderness. He came up out of death, victorious. We see again a picture of the cross here. I think this is our fourth major time we've seen the cross in the Song of Solomon. That's a big deal. And she sees him. She sees him. I think that's key. It's her speaking here. Who is this coming out of the wilderness like a pillar of smoke? The couch on page 66 Solomon's couch, it's kind of like you would think of a litter, you know, a, um, and I don't know if it's enclosed or not. There's different words for it, but it's uh, poles, yeah. and he's sitting up on it, and he's being carried, okay? Flush. Hmm, yeah, 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 very much so, yes. A litter, litter. mm-hmm, yeah. King Solomon, so... King Solomon is a representation of King Jesus. The couch was like a chariot during the wedding procession. The couch is carried on the shoulders of the guards. And it is where the bride sat near him, protected through the wilderness journey. It's so interesting that we see this kind of come back around again, the cross. Focus on the cross. The cross. She's sitting next to him. She's seated with him on the couch, right? That's where the bride gets seated, is on the couch. In the pillar of smoke, this would have been the dust from the royal procession, but also the pillar of smoke prophetically spoke of the glory of God. Speaking poetically, Jesus is the picture here as coming up from the wilderness of this world in the glory of God. Perfumed with myrrh. What's myrrh? Death. death. It, it, it represented death, right? It was what they bear, uh, they, the spices that they put on people when they were burying them. Frankincense is representative of, we've talked about this once before, it's intercession. It says that the prayers of the saints rise as frankincense. It also speaks of the bowls before the throne. That There's a bowl before the throne that holds the prayers of the saints. What? That is so unbelievable. That prayers, the prayers of the saints throughout time, throughout history, are collecting in this bowl. And there is appointed times in certain things in the coming of Christ, in the, 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 um, a lot of things with Israel, a lot of things with the church, that there's this accumulation of the prayers of the saints. So she says that he comes up perfumed in incense. And this is where I wanted to show you a verse in Job. It's Job chapter 9, verse 3. Job is in a mess. We're not going to talk a lot about Job, but I, I, read Job, I read the book of Job a couple times this last summer and just really studied it. And um, Job got to the point where he was blaming God for his problems. He got really mad at God, actually. And even to the point where he was like, God's nice to the sinner, and he... 
It's mean to the righteous. And I mean, he was just really in a struggle. And it's a very, very long book. But in, in chapter 9, um, his friends tell him that he should go talk to God. This is what his friends told him, you need to go talk to God. And he makes this comment in, in 9.3, if one wished to contend with him, speaking of God, he could not answer him one time out of a thousand. There's another verse. That's not the one exactly that I wanted. But there's another verse, and this is the picture that it gives. He is crying out for a mediator. It's also known as an intercessor. Job desires, he actually comes to the point where he said, Ken, if I had someone that could put one hand on God and one hand on me, he longs for an intercessor. He longs for a mediator, someone who could stand and put one hand on God and one hand on him. And that is actually what this verse, perfumed with myrrh and with frankincense, his death empowered the intercession. The intercession is the mediation. He made a way that we could sit on the couch with him. He made a way where Jesus, the intercessor, the mediator, you understand that word means the same thing, came and put one hand on God and one hand on us. It's this beautiful picture that we're seeing here. It's verse 33. Verse 33 of 9? Oh, awesome. I must have just written it down wrong. Yeah. Nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand on us both. He was actually saying, no, I can't go talk to him. I can't go talk to him. By the way, if you did not know this, but at the end of Job, Job is actually very much corrected by God. <laughs> Just to let you know that. <laughs> Sometimes we like to quote Job. So, so, yes, he was very much corrected by God. Um, okay. Yeah. The mer and then he was very blessed. The merchant's fragrant powders. This, uh, the merchant's powders represents Jesus' commitment to us. He is like a merchant that gave everything to purchase us. This is all about the cross, all about the way being made through him. Hmm. I just wonder at the jump here. I never really thought about it. But, you know, you have her not wanting to get out of bed. And then she does get out of bed. And then she encounters him. And then the Lord says, hey, I'm doing a work in her heart. Don't, don't mess with her. And then the next thing is, she sees him. She sees something new. She sees him on a couch. She sees him coming out of the wilderness. She sees this pillar of smoke. She sees the finished work of the cross, the intercession that he provided. She, I, you know, you just wonder, is she just having this new revelation, new encounter with who he is, with each growth that she takes, there's a new encounter and it all comes back to the cross every time. It's so cool. It's so awesome. Um, 60 Valiant Men, it, this represents the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit experts in war. And we're going we're gonna to pick up here next week when we come back. I'm going to talk about the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Um, but I am, pro I am so provoked, you gals, over and over about how I have neglected focusing on the work of the cross. That 
I haven't, I haven't, remember it says like myrrh, she held it dear to her heart. Like an apple tree, she sat under it and took delight. Here, she's having this new encounter with the Lord that I have to believe that came out of her choice to obey and follow him. And it's of him, again, what he did, what he provided, what he did for her. Um, he said he did a work in her heart. Yeah. And then she saw that. Yeah. You know, he, he did that for that revelation. And it's by her giving permission by saying, yeah. yes, I will follow you. Yeah. And then there's this new revelation of him. Yeah, because he doesn't go against our will. Nope. We have to have the... Absolutely. Absolutely. So, we're actually going to... It is... 15 minutes, um, we're going to listen to a couple songs. Does everybody have their song sheets? There's two of them. Um, and I realized that I don't think I have the second one. Now there's, all the second ones are gone. So, oh, okay. That's awesome. If Okay. Thank you, Pat. Um, so I was listening. I actually now have a little playlist on my phone, um, and I call it the Song of Solomon playlist. And any, any songs that I come across that are based on Song of Solomon, I put on this playlist. And, um, both of these are sung by John Thurlow. John Thurlow is a worship leader out at IHOP. And um, I hope... Oh, yeah, there it is. That's kind of fun. Yeah. Um, number four... Uh, it is on the first page. It's uh, it just uh, says Dove's Eyes at the top, Missy Edwards. <laughs> yeah, with a one. Thank you. <laughs> Do y'all see that? Y'all have it? There's a couple more over there. If you don't, yeah. <laughs> okay, so so um, on on the back side on the back side of that page is song number four. And it says, uh, let me see your face. And then at the bottom of the page is song seven, which is Jesus, you're beautiful, which we actually um, listened to before. But this is why it's song four and song seven. This is why I chose this on the way over here. I was listening to let me see your face. We just got done reading that part of Song of Solomon, right? Let me see your face. Actually, it was kind of fun. I, I wrote down the scripture references next to each one. Um, he's talking about feeling he, he's... It, it, actually, this song is God singing to us, which is really cool, songs like that. And he's talking about shame and being afraid and, um, and just wondering how you will run over the hill with me, which is kind of like what mom said is this, ah, oh, I want to obey, but I don't know if I can. Like this feeling uh, lack. And then he says, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. Let me see the one I want so near. Um, and then he goes on, and then he says, I'm looking ahead, and I can already see you leaning. That's cool. Which we just talked about that in chapter 8. She learns to lean. And the father in this song is saying, I already see you in your maturity. It's there. It's right, it's right over the hill. It's right there. And, and just this encouragement, this encouragement of the Lord that he sees us 
He sees us in maturity. He sees us in Christ. I just so want to encourage you gals, get this in your prayer language. Get this in your conversations with the Lord that you're proclaiming and declaring how he sees you and what you see in him. The bottom of the page, we already did this song once, but I actually was like, okay, so this top song is God talking to us. And then I wanted a song of us responding because he asks to see our face. He asks to hear our voice. And it's a prayer, spirit of wisdom, open my eyes again. Spirit of revelation, open my heart again. It's all about the Holy Spirit empowering us to do any of this. We need to be in constant fellowship with the Holy Spirit, asking him, Holy Spirit, help me see this right. Help me hear you. Help me obey. Help Holy Spirit, cause me to want to want what you want. Seriously, that we just ask him, give us the want, give us the desire. I don't even have that. I want to be lazy, but give me the want to obey. And then he goes on and he says, I want to see you rightly, Jesus. And I think I shared this before with you guys. I know that your eyes are like flames of fire. The flames of fire, this is in, um, this is actually in Revelations 1. I read it last week at the beginning of class. Flames of fire, his burning love for us, his bride. Your head is white as wool. It's his good leadership in our life. He is, see, he's declaring these things back to the Lord. I know that you love me. I know that you're a good leader. Your voice is like sounds of many waters, which is a strong, powerful voice. Jesus, you're beautiful. So <clears throat> we're going to do that, and then we'll just see. Um, we'll probably just close in prayer, but I want you guys to, to connect here with what's going on. Has he hiding in shame? The knowledge that you're not as strong as you thought you were. You're so afraid of what lies ahead. You're thinking, How will you run over the Will I not leave you now? I'm still here. Just let me see your face. Let me just hear your voice. Let me see the one I want so near. Let me see your face Let me just hear your voice Let me see the one I want So near And I see the longing Under the fear I see it in your heart to finish the race with me. I know if you just say yes again, together we can make the longing reality. So I Let me see your face Let me just hear your voice Let me see the one I want so
so near Just let me see your face Let me just hear your voice Let me see the one I want So near Don't hide away Let me see your face Let me just hear your voice let me see the one I want So near Cause I'm looking ahead I can already see you leaning I'm looking ahead down the road I can already see you trusting I'm looking ahead I can already see you running with me I'm looking ahead, I can already see you leaning I'm looking ahead, I can already see you leaning I'm looking ahead, I can already see you leaning But in the meantime, let me see your face let me just hear your voice Let me see the one I want So near Let me see your face Let me just hear your voice Let me see the one I want So near Your 
You're beautiful. You're beautiful. We believe you, Lord. We believe you. We, we set our eyes upon you right now. Here we are. Here we are, Lord. 
You say our face is lovely. You say our voice is sweet. We just come to you right now. Holy Spirit, Spirit of wisdom and revelation, come, burn within us the picture of the Father, the picture of the Son, the picture of you. Burn within us. We declare that we believe you. That's right. We believe you. Holy Spirit, empower us to obey the voice of the Father. Empower us to obey. Holy Spirit, remove every lie that would cause us to pull away from obedience, that would cause us to feel lacking. I call down every lie that says we're not spiritually equipped enough for victory. I call down that lie. Holy Spirit, we have you. We have all that we need. Right now, we call upon you for your grace to obey. Your grace to hear the voice of the Lord clearly. Lord, we ask you to weed up every hindrance, every lie, everything that would try to trip us up. Pull it up, Lord God. Every, everything in us that we have ca called our personality, our personal, our nature, that's not of you. Yes, Lord. I ask you to remove it. Yes, Lord. We want to go with you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Holy Spirit, hallelujah, come. Hallelujah. Go deep within us. Reveal to us all that Jesus did. That his hand is upon the Father and his hand is upon us. That he made a way. It is not in and of ourself. It is because of him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you, draw us. Draw us into a clearer, deeper more consistent, focused relationship face-to-face -face with our beloved. I am a friend of the bridegroom. I hear your voice. I obey you. I know your tender heart towards me. And my heart is tender towards you in return. Thank you, Lord. We just we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness your kindness. Father, weed out, weed out every lie, the ones that we have given an excuse to be there, that we've justified, that it seems right that we feel that way or think that way, that we have all the reasons in the world to, but if it's not of you, Lord, we don't want it. We don't want it. We want only what comes from you, only your heart. Your heart. 